other people. And that can help you do anything from uh, get a promotion within your organization, create a sense of community with your colleagues, find new customers, and, um, and really to really define your purpose within a team or organization. Personal brand, particularly if you look at yourself as a leader. And when I say a leader, I mean someone who is willing to go the extra mile, who's willing to step up, not just what your job title is, but anyone who takes risks, who works beyond what their job description is, that is to me a leader, even if you're in a, a, an early stage of your career or even in an entry level job. When you really understand your brand and what your values are, you can also contribute to your community, to your family, as well as your organization. So when you identify, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, then you can begin to see that in a much broader sense than just, this is, this is my story and where I want to go in the company or you're in your own business. You can really see what you can contribute to the world at large. And having a brand is, is really, it's less complicated than people think. You've already got one. Your brand is less about creating something than it is about identifying who you already are. Your brand is simply your image, your reputation, or as Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon said, your brand is what people say about you when you leave the room. In other words, your brand is who you are, but it's up to you to manage and refine and control that so that you're putting your best brand story forward. All right, so let me get it. And, and another way to think about your brand, and this is probably my favorite way to think about it, is your brand is simply a promise of value. No different than an airline or a global company, your brand is the the value that you bring. So it is a promise. It's a promise statement. Now a successful brand is one that, that delivers on that promise over time. It's almost worse to make a promise and not keep it than not make that promise in the first place. But I think it's even better to identify what your promise is, what your contributions are, and then to continue to deliver that promise, deliver that value over time, and that's what creates a long-term successful brand reputation. So there are three keys that I see to defining to creating a successful brand. First is define your value. You've really, I'll, I'll get into some ways that you could, what is it that I uniquely bring to the table? Even if I do something similar to a colleague, by virtue of you being the only one of you bring something that no one else brings, and it's up to you to refine that. That's where I talk about refining your message and a message or story that you put out to the outside world. And then finally, as I mentioned, it's all about deliverance. Once you've defined your value, you've that message in attention to want to listen to you so that you have some influence, that you have some power in your brand, you've got a compelling story, then of course you just continue to deliver on that promise over time. And that's really my hope today, what you've heard me do, and I'll just be completely transparent in this definition. I'm defining my value, this is my background, I've been within the corporate world as the head of communications at studios, I've taken that into my role as an executive leadership expert to help you define that value, refine your message, and then deliver on that. So first, when you look at defining your value, you, you look at that picture there and you see, yes, we many of us have been trained, I think Americans may be a little less so than other people uh, around the world, is that we, if you stand out, and I don't mean in a way that makes you arrogant or unlikable, you can stand out in a full way, but really understanding what makes you the red apple in a sea 
unique traits and personalities. And when you inject those into your brand and into the workforce and let yourself really make the best of your own skills and unique style, meaningful. It makes you memorable to the greater organization. So the first thing you would do is ask yourself, what is the value I bring? And I, everybody on this webinar right now, I really suggest that you write down, what's the value that I bring? And I'll tell you, my value is working with people to articulate the message that they bring and also their position in the marketplace. Where do you fit in? to your corporation, into your own business in terms of your customers and the message you bring. And, and how does that stack up against your competitors? So you think about that value. What are your strengths and skills? What is your unique, and, and those we sometimes call hard skills, technical skills, whether your skills are in um, in finance and accounting, whether your skills are in the technical and the realm of the internet or coding or technical skills, whether your skills are in research or development. I mean, there's a broad variety. Maybe your skills are creative. You're in a, a role of marketing. Maybe your skills are managerial, where you manage other people and complete tasks. So really understand, even at an end your career, you have unique skills from what you've studied in, in university or in early internships or jobs that you've had um, or your academic studies. You've begin, begun to discover this skill set and where your strengths lie, and they usually lie in an area or two. Then ask yourself, what are my passions? What do I care deeply about? How do my skills and passions link together? I, to me, that's the best of all. If you say, well, my passions are working with artwork and design and graphics, and my skills happen to be uh, working on Photoshop and InDesign and, and web websites and, and art, then your skills and your passions are aligning, and that's really a great place to be. And then if you add to that, what are the needs in the workplace? What is the job market like? What is your organization, your company? What do your customers want? So when your skills and strengths and your passions line up with what the workplace wants from you, then that's where the magic begins and you begin to create a really exciting career. Now even if you are in the you're in a lake you've created a brand, people know you for let's say they, they know that you're an, an excellent manager, that you've got a great level of influence, you're a great project leader. You can add to your brand is always in a sense of evolution. It's always changing to what you're learning and how you're growing and what the marketplace wants, but your brand is forward thinking. What you're learning and what you're growing into. So you should think of your personal brand as something that is always in the growth stage. It's always evolutionary. So the second step is to refine your message. This is from a, a talk that I did in Kuwait and they wanted to know what my message and it was about how you define your brand, how you articulate it, how you position yourself within the marketplace, even against competition. You've got to look at those disruptors who are bringing new things to the marketplace and think about how you tell them a way that elevates you from, gee, that's interesting or that would be nice to have, to this is someone we want on board or this is someone we want on our team or something that is that takes you from a gee that's nice to a very compelling I want to know more about this and that's all in the refining the message and the telling of the story everything you do is creating a story from the the way you look to the way you speak to good news is you get to be the one that crafts it. You are the one that gets to tell the story. And it's important to create a clear and compelling 
message that's interesting, that's memorable, that's meaningful to others, so that your clients, so that your customers recognize, without a doubt, there's no question what you do and what you have to offer. They want to know, and I always tell people who, who, sometimes I'll have clients who have six different ways of defining who they are and what they do, and I always tell them, you've got to be clear. If you can be clear and but if you can only be one, you want to be clear about that brand promise so people understand how they can interact with you, what they should expect with you, what you from you, and what you bring to the table. Now, here is a relatively simple way to look at that brand formula. The brand promise is really, maybe you've heard somebody say the term or brand value statement or something like that. And for how you think about and how you talk about your brand. And it's as simple as this, as you, it's, this is a, a formula that I use. So you can write this down or I'll share this slide later on. You can say, I help or I guide or I develop. Um, your core client, who's your end user? Is it maybe you are in the with with doctors, physicians, you work with hospitals. Who's your client? Um, people who need websites developed for them. So maybe you work with small business owners. So I help small business owners. This is where you add your action verb. Learn, create, build, design, develop an outstanding website so that their customers can find them or can interact with them. So this is where you plug in that core data about important. And this really answers the question that inevitably we are all asked in the workplace, uh, even in social situations. And that question, even though we often know it's coming, can be difficult for us to answer, and the question is usually about yourself, or, or what kind of work are you in? It's something along those lines, which is an invitation for you to talk about yourself. And here's what this looks It's your name, who you help or work for, that core client, you do, and the outcome. So here's mine. Libby Gill coaches. Remember, I have an executive coaching business. I go in and work with leaders and men. The established, those are more seen, emerging, the rising stars, the up and coming leaders like Disney, Kellogg's, Microsoft, I could add Intel or Cisco to inspire purpose and drive performance, team affects the bottom line or understands this is where you add what the outcome is that's relevant to your client. Now this is just a starting point. This is a baseline where you would begin to develop that core statement about what you do. And I'll give you an example. I worked with a a coach who was, it was really hard for her to define what she did because she worked with artists. It was a very creative field. It was about unlocking any blocks that they had so they could get in touch with their creative self. Uh, it's already inherently a little difficult to define because it, it, that, that's in the creative area. It's a little bit more abstract. And she was saying something like, I help people unlock energy blocks. And no one understood what she was talking about. That was very, so abstract and so creative that, that people couldn't figure what hire you to do. And she changed that brand story to, I coach artists, and she even got more specific type of artists, fine arts, painters, actors, and singers to release any block so that they can fulfill their creative expression 
or be hired for what they do. And once she defined it in a way that people understood, oh, I understand what you do, and now I can see myself within that story. I understand how I could hire you or interact with you employee or a consultant, you've got to make that clear purpose at the end of that story. So I don't know if we're going to open this up to any questions now. You're welcome to or we'll open that up at the end. I'll leave that to you. Um, if you want to, feel free to interrupt if there are any questions about this beginning part. Or I will move along to executive presence or leadership presence. Now, in 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 the West, and and this I think is beginning to filter out to other parts of the world because it can be so competitive now that we're in a much more digital, global, interconnected world uh, where. We virtual teams, we work online, we work across borders, that having a sense of presence can be really important. And um, to have this sense of executive presence, leadership presence, whatever you might call it in your world, and having a sense of presence is really about understanding who you are how you articulate that brand message we were talking about and how both through your visual face to face or you're meeting somebody for the first time in a meeting we tend to sum people up you on that but we tend to have an impression of somebody in depending on what research you look at in 5 to 30 seconds, we've made our mind up. And this really comes from our origins. This comes from the animal kingdom, that we we sum people up as friend or foe on a, on a subliminal level. We don't maybe consciously think, ah, I like this person or I don't like this person. But we definitely make some decisions about how we feel and how we want to interact. And it's interesting, the human brain, as much as it's developed over centuries, and we, of course, have developed to uh, survive all kinds of, of predators and natural incidents and all sorts of things in our lives, is we work very much on these visceral, these internal cues that we receive. And there's some interesting data about the, the we tend to, because we feel first and we about that for a minute. The, the amygdala, which is the most primitive part of our brain, it's changed the least over the years, is, is our fear center. That's where we get our cues of, is this friend or foe? And something as simple as, is this person smiling? Is there a sense of warmth in the handshake or the greeting? Is there, do I feel I can trust this person. Do I feel that there could be a sense of collaboration here? And it's interesting, the research, I was just reading up on this yesterday, we, there, there are two ways we perceive people. We, we get a sense of warmth or we get a sense of competence. Now, ideally, of course, we want to project and we'd like to feel in others a sense that, that, that we feel a sense of warmth and we feel a sense of competence. But of the two, it is often more important to feel a sense of warmth. Once we feel that, the competence is a good thing. That can be a benefit to us. But if we feel like this person is inauthentic, that we don't have a sense of connection, whatever those cues are, that the face is not matching up with the words, that we don't feel that, we feel some sort of disconnect, we'll have this sort of uh, hmm, I'm not sure that I, I, I like or trust this person. So you have to remember that that sense of visual cue, it includes facial expressions, the mannerisms or hand gestures. And for those of us in the West, and I think there's, there's some global truth to this, a relaxed and natural sense where we feel oh, I can relax around this person, there's a sense of warmth, there's a sense of authenticity, their words match their gestures. Those are the visual cues that we look 
look for. If we're trained in that, we look for it consciously. If we're not, we still pick it up unconsciously. We've all had that sense of meeting somebody who says something so nice and pleasant, and yet their demeanor, their eyes, their hands, we get this sense of, oh, okay, there's some real tension or fear or something that I'm not, not understanding about what's going on here. And we often retreat from that person. So what you want to do is, is not be that person. You want to, you want to make that connection so that there's a sense of warmth towards you. And then that's when the competence, when what you're able to do or share becomes really relevant. And we see that when we're selling. If somebody doesn't like who we are, they're often, they don't want to hear that we have. So you can't underestimate that impression that we make. Next is the, uh, another thing I should say about visual cues, and this is really interesting, and, and particularly for women who are emerging as leaders uh, around the, in many places around the world, is that we can, there's a fine line between giving off a sense of, um, of dominance and a sense of strength. So women leaders is something that's really important to remember. If, if we, I see this in, in conferences or at meetings, the people who shrink up, and you'll see this sometimes, they almost shrink into a little ball. Those are the people who are saying, please ignore me. I haven't earned my place at the table yet. But those among us who stand up straight, who breathe deeply, who command the room and have that sense of visual presence, we often earn, and it's not immediately all the time, but we often earn that sense of trust and respect. And again, that goes to the animal kingdom, that the, the, the predators, the lions, the, the, the big cats or other animals will stand up straight, or not stand up straight, but take up space. They, they show their dominance, they show their strength. And we usually, if it's unthreatening, we will pay attention to that person. That's, that's somebody that we want to listen to, that we want to follow or emulate. Our voice tells a lot about us, and this is a sense of vocal energy. And here in, in the U.S., deep male voices are considered the most authoritative. That's changing, obviously, with more women in the workplace, more women in positions of power. It's not so much about having that deep and resonant voice, which we don't all have. I have a voice, it's, it's not necessarily a high voice, but it's in that mid-range. But what you want to think about, and again, this is not just your, your, com your, your country's culture, um, and your heritage, but also within your corporate culture, within your business culture, because they all vary. Every, every organization, even down to a team of two or three people, has its unique culture. But having some energy in your voice, putting some color in your, in your vocal, in your language, in the way you come across, and keeps them interested, but, but you keep them all listening. And you do that through varying the rhythm, and that is the rate of speech. You can speed up when you've got something really exciting that you want to deliver, or perhaps you slow down when there's something that you really want to make an important point with. You vary the color, the rhythm, even the volume. And that's very important to keep your listeners engaged, to create a sense of authority and power. You're not backing off. You are using both your visual And then finally, there's that sort of magical, a charismatic element that I call veritas. And that's really is my made up word that is a combination of the Latin word gravitas or important significance and veracity, which is truth. Those together, and I think of that as having a, a power and truthful message, that you are true to who you are, and that there's some power and significance of what you influence other people with those three Vs, the visual cues, the vocal energy, and the veritas, the truthfulness and significance 
of what you have to offer. Finally, you deliver upon that excellence. And I'm going to wrap up in just a few minutes for questions. I know we started a little bit late, but I will I'll wrap up and, and call for questions. But finally, once you've created this brand statement, this is who I am, this is what I deliver, you've created that sense of expectation that of what the person, whether that's your internal team or stakeholders or supervisors, can expect from you or your external customers, you deliver upon that excellence every time. And nobody goes without making a mistake, but even a mistake, even a setback is an opportunity for you to further explain how your brand will correct that mistake. It's an opportunity for excellence and, and interaction with your core user. And the best way to do that is to really clarify your vision. Where are you headed in one year, in three years? Simplify the path to reaching that vision and executing the plan. How do you stay on plan aggressively towards that end goal? And in my book, You Unstuck, I talk about that in great detail, how you create that plan and continue towards it. Um, this is a, a I, I went to visit Bhutan and climbed a Himalayan mountain up to this monastery, which is called the Tiger's Nest. And it really made my corporate message really personal at that point, my profess, professional message, which is to lift as you climb. And that's, that's my tweetable. That's really my signature, my, my mantra that I live by. And that means take others with you, give back, take somebody's hand, offer them opportunity, share your knowledge, tell them what you know, help other people on their way up. Essentially, lift as you climb. On your journey to professional success, take others with you. And here's how I'd like to do that. I want to share this with you and just jot this down. This is a, a branding quiz that I developed for, for everybody who needs to make a brand statement about their business, or whether that's your own business or you work in the corporate, private, or government sector. And it's called mybrandingquiz.com. You just go online and put that in your search bar, www.mybrandingquiz.com. And this is my gift to you where you can get some information immediately. It's a, a, about a three-minute survey that you would take to answer some questions about your own brand and see what's working for you now and what you want to work on. And you'll, you'll also get some fun bonus, some expert excerpts from my books for you. And, and here's my branding book, The Art and Science, Capture the Mind Share and the Market Share Will Follow, You Unstuck. And you can go right to my website at LibbyGill.com and download this book about leadership, The Hope Driven Leader. Those are people that really inject that positive sense of engagement with their customers and their clients and colleagues. And that, to me, is the best way to go forward, is taking other people with you as you climb. And I will open this now for some questions. And thank you so much for the opportunity to the GBNTC for giving me this opportunity today. And I hope you'll all stay in touch by going to my website at LibbyGill.com or taking advantage of my branding quiz, which gives us an opportunity to interact together. Um, thank you. May I open this up to questions now? Is this time for that? Thank you, Ms. Libby, for an thank interesting you. presentation. Dear attendees, we are open for the question and okay. discussion. You can either put your question in the chat box or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon available on your webinar console. Uh, Miss Libby, we have a question from Mr. Ilav Abdirazak. Uh, how can young leaders create credible brands when they are so young? That's a good question. When you're young, when you're starting your career, a lot of young people or early career stage people think, well, I can't possibly have a brand yet. I haven't really done anything. I'm new is who you are is really the greatest um, essence of your brand. So you have to think again, even though you may just gotten, have gotten out of university or business school, what is it that I bring forward by my education, my academic training? What are my passions? What are my skills? And again, go back to what is it I have to offer? Your brand 
it, it really is who you are, but it's about what you bring to the world. So you've got to think about even as a, as a new employer, somebody starting out, are you a great researcher? Are you great with, with, uh, online technology can you are you a coder are you a great accounting or finance person think about that Brandon when I was in Kuwait and was speaking to a, a big group there it was a group of marketing and communications people and a young man and said to me, well, you know, I work in this finance company, but I, my background is not finance. I'm one of the few people without finance and business training, but my background is research. I came out of, and I said, well, isn't that wonderful? You've got something that nobody else in your organization has. Let them know that your background is research and that you can help them on that side of the business. That this is not a liability, this is not a problem, something terrific that you have to share. And that put his background in a whole new light and he saw this is not something to hide, this is something to bring forward as part of my brand. As he learned more and more about business and finance, he could say, I have a background in hard research. If there's any data that you need or you need me to help you translate this data to move forward in terms of analytics and decision making, let me know. I'm happy to help. And that became a huge, not only did it clarify for him what his brand was, but it was a real differentiator. He brought something very different to the organization that was truly an asset. And I should mention, many of us take what we do for granted because we assume everyone else has that skill. But a good writer does not mean everybody sitting in the, you know, in the organization at the next cubicle or in the next office is also a good writer. So if that happens to be something you're good at and a skill that's needed, let people know. Weave that into that brand story that you have about yourself. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Ms. Libby. Uh, Mr. Love of the Result uh, is asking another question. What distinguish male and female leadership brands? That's a very good question. And I'll have to tell you, I speak about this all the time because I do a lot of work with women in leadership. And I've spoken to a number of women's groups. Clearly, men and women are not the same. Our brains are not wired the same. Uh, whether that matters in the workplace, that's a matter of individual opinion. I think much more as a, an individualist. I do think there are some traits women have in common and men have in common, but it's not across the board. It's more unique to who we are individually. One thing I'll tell you about working with the U.S. and, and you know, half a dozen other countries around the world is that th the playing field is not even. There are obviously far more men in power than there are women. I think as women, it's important to err on the side of strength rather than weakness. And we have to understand there are some pitfalls that go with that. There are some men who are not used to strong women or strong women leaders but we have to let them know that the strength that we bring to a company or an organization is good for the whole. And there's a learning curve, and I'm writing a book about this subject right now because it can be so difficult. And I work with a, a lot of, you know, as be outspoken, sometimes to a fault. And women leaders sometimes feel, shout their male counterparts. I don't necessarily share that belief, but I do think we cannot err on the side of silence or weakness. I do think we have to put a strong brand forward. Sometimes we have to wait our turn for that promotion, but it's the same thing with women. We have to create that strong brand story about what we have to bring in terms of value. It's really about what we bring the organization. And I don't think we should back off because we're women. There's a little cultural baggage that we all bear in terms of 
of who we are and where we come from and how we've been raised. And it's it's just smart. It's good business to, if you know the expression, to read the room, to understand your culture of your organization. And and really to, I think, for women to to move that forward. And that's so helping women and women helping men. Um, I think I heard you there. Did you have another question? So, uh, another one from Mr. Ilaf Abdirazak. Have you worked with engineers and leadership? What advice would you give them? I am a female engineer and would like to pursue a leadership opportunity. However, switching BWO hard, between hard and soft skills is challenging. I missed a little bit of that. I think you said how to, a woman engineer, how to uh, how to work in leadership. Is that correct? So I think for a, if I'm understanding, a woman engineer to find her place in leadership, it really is a blend of the hard skills. Those are technical skills, and I don't mean just technology, but skills that you bring forward in terms of of um, finance, legal, business, all of those skills that typically get you where they get you to a point of professionalism. They help you move up that corporate ladder, up the leadership ranks. And then it becomes about what we call the soft skills, communication, influence. We call them soft skills not because they're unimportant but, but because they're a little bit harder to measure. It's about influencing others, about inspiring them so they, they want to follow, about building deep relationships. You need to really build a network and relationships with people before you need them. It's very difficult to call someone when you don't know them and ask for something that you need. Instead, you need to get out and meet your colleagues and meet people that you will need to work with in the future or people that you admire and begin to build that leadership support. That's what helps you grow up the ladder, being very clear about what your technical or hard skills are, really learning to master the soft skills of communication, of collaboration, of management and then beginning to let people know what you're capable of and not hiding the fact that you've got those skills. Another thing I see um, for women is we tend not to ask, and I think this is very much a global issue. We have been enculturated to help and build and share with others more than we have to lead in many instances. And I think we have to say, I'd like that next job. I'd like to grow within the organization. I'd like to be a leader. And to make that clear to your leaders and supervisors and ask, what would it take for me to move up to this next level? What would it take for me to be a manager or to take on a leadership role? And find out what the answer is. is is it expertise? Is it a, another degree that you need from university? Is it that you need to demonstrate that you've reached a certain threshold of, of competence or you've met a, a sales quota? Whatever it is, you need to understand. And if someone can't tell you, if they can't articulate what that is, that's a sign that you really need to have your own metrics of what will help you advance in your career. And when you've met them, it's appropriate to say, what's next for me? And it's always in context of, how do I bring more value to the company? How do I bring more to the organization? What can I do next that would be beneficial? Not what's next for me. How It, it is what's next for you, but it's also it's what you bring to your company that, that, that they're looking for. And that's completely fair. That's why you're there. Does that make sense? Wonderful answer, Libby. Thank you very much. And there's another one. Why is it so important to develop your own personal brand? Well, I think what you say about yourself and how you fashion 
the story that you tell, not only how you think about yourself, but the story that you tell others, is how people will think of you. If you say, I'm, I'd like a leadership position someday, or I want to be the best salesperson on this team, or I have a goal of this, you know, people begin to hear you and believe you, especially when you demonstrate those skills. And our brands, we plant that seed of recognition, like this fellow in Kuwait who was such a good researcher, but people didn't know it. When they understand, oh yes, you, you not only know the finance, he'd learned the finance side of the business, but he had this deep knowledge of reading analytics and reading research, and he could help people extrapolate the information that they needed. So that's how you plant that seed of greatness. Here's what I have to offer, and here's where I'm going within this organization. If you leave that to others, they're likely to tell the wrong story about you. Well, decide this you're this kind of person and in fact that's just one piece of what you can do you're going to be very limited in where you can go it's much easier to create that brand than it is to change one you know 20 or 30 years into your career so you want to be having those seeds of what that brand story is and and able to articulate that especially when someone gives you license when they say tell me what you do or what gets you excited about the work you're doing or what do you bring to the team or the company? That's your invitation to share your story. Be excited about it. Tell a great story about yourself. That's what people will remember. And many of us have a great personal story where we went to, to school, to university, a special skill that we bring. Of, uh, of, of teaching or training or something that we share with the world outside of work. Even if it's related to the work you do, even better. I've, I've worked with a lot of people who, who work in, in some sort of leadership role in, in a, um, in a non-profit sense or in a helping sense in their, in their community at large. And being able to share that that's something people remember about you. That's something that they can hang on to because at bottom we're, we're all sharing this human experience. I mean, that's why I think that lift as you climb is such a relevant and important thing. I mean, I want people to remember that as my brand. I want to give more than people expect and I will always want them to have some sort of takeaway that they can use. So it's conceptual information combined with the practical and to me that's what leadership is about. It's the hard skills combined with the soft skills that make you able to bring a wealth of knowledge and, and really the good heartedness to share it with others. Are there any more questions? Thank you, Ms. Libby, uh, for such an interactive presentation. So this brings us towards the end of the webinar. Any concluding remarks from your side, Ms. Libby, before we dismiss this session? Well, I just want to invite everyone to sign up for my newsletter. They'll receive this leadership book, um, e-book. And um, we can stay in touch. And I, I welcome emails with questions. And you can reach me directly at Libby at LibbyGill.com or take MyBrandingQuiz.com and we'll be able to stay in touch. So I really do want to give ongoing value to your community as well. Once again, I really want to thank you, Ms. Libby, on behalf of GB and DC for your valuable time and sharing valuable information with us. We are recording this webinar and it will be uploaded on our website. So please stay tuned to webinar GBN, webinar webinar.gbntc.com for updates for this webinar. Thank you all of those who have attended this webinar. With that, I would like to end this webinar and you all will be automatically dismissed thank you very much and all you all have a good day bye 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 thank you